So from now I already learned a lot today and so we keep with that and do dashboard visualizations. So we start from scratch and try to become production ready in the end. So for this talk, just imagine you're sitting at work and a colleague is proceeding to your desk like, you know, we're doing this thing and we want to convince the boss in the end it's better what we're doing. So we are doing this kind of A-B thing and we want to show at the end, like at the presentation, oh yeah, this really worked. Like, it was really better. And you think like, okay, like I can do this. Like, that's easy. I mean, we have this massive raw big data, everything is collected, every feature switch, anything. And then just, I select the right tables, I get this stuff together, and I select a representation, and I mean, that's it. Put it there. No idea what you're talking about, that can't be that difficult. So you say, okay, I do a little sketch before. I mean, it's always good to have a little sketch before you start programming, so let's do this. So you think of the time, like we do this for three weeks, we have this A-B testing going on, and it's like, imagine a big online shop and we wanna like get purchases high, so make a lot of money there. And uh, so you have that graph and you imagine, okay, we have one variant A and a variant B and at the end it will look something like this. And we go to the boss and say, okay, variant B is better and please, you know, about this promotion thing. And uh, so, yeah, who of you like thinks this is a good idea to do for this A-B testing? Just who's like convinced, let's do this. Oh, not so many. So who has some like concerns? There might be something wrong with this. No? Oh, yes, there's some. Okay. okay. Yeah, so what might happen to you is at the end you get something like this. And then it's a bit hard to argue about this, you know, promotion thing. And um, so, yeah, you're not quite sure. Like, there's variant A in this. Like, let's see here. So maybe this is some better here, but the other thing is better here. Might be a bit difficult. So what was missing maybe in all this consideration and planning and sketching is readability. And it's not that you couldn't read the font size, the font size was quite okay here, but what you couldn't see is like you had this question in mind, what's the better variant? And you looked at the graph and you were still confused. So what you wanted is at the end, see like, yeah, it's clearly variant B, it's like no question at all. So when you do a chart or anything of this, always consider this, what's the question? And how can I really make like 99% sure that I will be able to answer that question at the end? And if you're not sure, like consider further, like which information do I really need to say at the end, yes, it's variant A, or yes, it's variant B. So on the way, we can consider all that, like which dimensions are important, but how can I display this? Um, what kind of interaction may I offer to you? And also make sure the data is correct at the end. So always double check at the end, like if, especially if do, you do like data-driven things, make sure that the data is really correct and really <coughs> valuable for this setup, for the things you wanna do. Great, so if you look at dimensions, you can have like hundreds of dimensions. If you look at your data, especially if you like big data collecting everything, then everything can be a dimension for you. Um, you can have the time, where is it from, where's your user from, was it the success, failure, was he here before, what kind of features did I display to him, in which relation, is he in my target group, maybe I have different target groups, so there's a whole thing you can have, so there's like, you can have hundreds of those, but make sure you're picking the ones that are really, in this case, like really considerable and really telling you something more. If you just um, say like, okay, I look at the locations and maybe it's totally unimportant from which location they are coming from because it's the same feature you're displaying and maybe, um, yeah, that is, doesn't matter at all. So the other thing is now, how do you encode this? So you're very like lucky that the brain has a very high visual like bandwidth. So you can have like 9,000 bits per second that is just processed through your eyes. 
if you're reading, this is about like 80. So this is like a huge difference, how much information you can convey. And here you see some examples, so never ever do this in one track. So it's just like to, to show what you can do. So you can have like easily you get the colors, you, you easily see the connections of colors. You can have like connection lines or do a group. You can all also have different shapes, you will easily get the connections of shapes. So these are kinds how you like make it easier for the, the one that is looking at your chart to get the information. I mean, you always could do like just a table, but it's really hard to get information and also relations from just a table. So try to, to find an encoding that is really easily visible and recognizable. Okay, so now we have a graph and you always have to differentiate between different things. So maybe colors are, as I showed before, a really nice thing. So you think like, okay, let's pick three colors. We have three variants, um, red, yellow, green. That's a nice thing. So who of you thinks like, yeah, that's a good thing to do? Yes, no one, okay. So then I don't have to take, say much about this because of course it has semantics. Red always feels a bit negative and wrong and green feels more positive and right. So you don't wanna have that bias in your graph. And also for colorblind, it will be really hard. So there's 9% of every male and 1% female um, who are colorblind and they won't see the difference at all. So that's really hard for them to get the chart then. Great, so what you can use is color schemes and then it's really easy because even if you're colorblind, completely colorblind, you will see the different shades. And there's a really nice helping website. You can just go there and grab a color scheme that you like and make sure it's um, safe for colorblind people as well. Great, so when you're now starting and like, okay, maybe I can do a better thing than just a little line chart or bar graph, um, just get out, get inspiration. It's not like you're doing copycat and you have to feel bad about that. It's really like getting inspiration. There's so much stuff out there. Just look at it, just see maybe here's a feature I like and here someone is doing something that I think would be suitable for my case as well. Just like spend some like half an hour to go and explore and um, afterwards try to draw that into something that is usable for you and what you would like to have. Um, great, so um, if you have a dashboard, it's normally somewhere up or it's somewhere where you can view it, but um, sometimes you have a desktop version and then you're also, uh, also considering um, interaction possibilities, so maybe you can do mouse over, display more details on highlighting, or you can filter and say, okay, I offer a special time range, just the last month, the last week, the last day, today, whatever. Um, you can offer to sort the data already or on click. Um, you can also have, especially if like a location thing, you can like zoom into just Europe or j zoom out for the whole world. Um, you can drag around and there it's that, that you're also offering this like, exploring that even if someone doesn't have a concrete question in mind, he can look at your visualization and then maybe um, questions pop up like why this, um, is there something special going on in Japan, why are so many people from Japan buying, why are nobody from China is coming, things like that, but still keep in mind that you clearly answer those questions and can answer those questions. And if you have different visualizations, you can also link them, so if in, there's an interaction in one of them, the other one can update on the fly if you want that. Great, so let's just look at an example. And if you, let's say you're, you're the manager and you're looking at this, like that's your day-to-day -day dashboard. Okay, what did you get? What's the next decision you're making based on the data you saw? Change the dashboard. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so consider like 10 seconds. If you, somebody is looking at your dashboard and in 10 seconds he can't tell you something, he can't tell you what to do or where something is wrong, then your dashboard is wrong. So um, just draw in the beginning a little sketch. Just consider which information do I want to have. Like do I just want to know how many people ordered? Do I want to have visible how many failed? And there it's a bit difficult because you don't have a context. Is 99 fails 
really like crashing because you only have 100 users? Or is 99 out of a billion and that's quite okay? So you can also offer here like say, okay, maybe we did 70, uh, 70K, but 30K are missing. So all already provide a context for your number. And maybe it's only interesting that you have a trend, like it was 15 last week, it's 25 now, that's okay. Uh, maybe you want something a bit more, but be aware that this has easily um, be visible and graspable. And you all can also do this. So then you already give a, oh, I'm sorry. You already give a hint, this is good, this is bad. And here you have also this color encoding. So even if you just walk by this, you will see, but if there's something orange, something is wrong. So this is like a hint for you, like also maybe you know from Jenkins build stuff, if everything is green, everything is all right. And if you see some directs, there is action. So you see color and now there has to be an action taken. Great, so if you now want to get started, create a new dashboard. So, of course, you won't write all the HTML, CSS on your own. There are many nice templates, so this is one built based on dashboards, uh, based on Bootstrap, sorry. <laughs> um, you can just explore it, even here, yeah. Um, you can see they just made it up to show the features, but also here, this would be maybe hard to get. Here, it's below the scroll line, so also here, there's no context offered, so um, be aware of that, that also the templates are not like made to be um, used as they are shown there. Great, so now let's go more towards the JavaScript part of this talk. So if you consider a framework, be careful because you're really stuck with that. So changing this framework of visualizations of a dashboard um, later on will be really hard. So think what you really need, who's your user, who will use this, is this a mobile thing, is it a dashboard that is displayed somewhere, do I care about things? And especially think of what do we want to spend? Do we want to spend developer time or do we want to have and buy something fixed and use it out of the box? So if you're now coming closer to JavaScript, maybe you know this uh, engineering flowchart of shall it move or shall it uh, stay fixed? So let's break it down to this in the JavaScript world. So if you want to make this decision, it's very simple. Ask yourself uh, three questions. Do I have special requirements? And if you don't, and you don't want to spend money, just go out there, take a framework, Google Charts, Flood Charts, Morris Charts, Charts, there's a lot of stuff. Just pick one of those. And if you can spend money, um, it's really worth it to take something that has a lot of stuff out of the box so you don't have to care and are really fast in development. So if you have special requirements, then think like, okay, is it completely crazy new stuff? Do I want to make a chart that never ever existed anywhere? No one ever will. Then there's D3DS. Maybe you already know about it or heard about it. Um, we'll have a look into this because it's special, it's different from the others. And if you have special requirement, but also want to have a normal bar chart beside, um, there are some libraries based on D3. So this is like my recommendation. Um, take something that is built up on D3, then you can do all the normal stuff like you can do with the others. But if you like at one time have a special requirement, you can just go in and write D3 code. Great, so here I found a really nice website to choose one of those frameworks, so if you decided um, what requirements you have. You can see here, you can just pick on the left what type of graph you need, what license, what options, and which dependencies, and it will already narrow down from like hundreds of frameworks that there are to maybe seven. So this is already a big advantage to only evaluate seven and get the best of it, then look at all of them. You can't do that anyway. So I talked about this difference, like there's D3 and there are all the other libraries. So in most libraries, you do some kind of, I do a new chart and I put in my settings, what I want to have, the size, the, the object, and things like that, and it just like um, will appear magically on my screen. What D3 is doing, here you're really kind of the painter, so you really instruct D3 what to do, and this gives, gives you all the opportunities you have there. Um, so, let's go really deep into D3. Um, first of all, it's based on scalable vector graphics. Maybe most of you know those or saw those, or you have like SVG sprites or things like that in your code. So you can like just do what, um, 
what you do in HTML with the tags to describe a document, you do here um, also with tags to describe the vector graphics. So here you just say rectangular and that's the features you can give. You have a circle, a line, a text, and that's important. You can group things together and then transform the whole group. Doing this is really helpful. We see that later. Um, so let's just look at a basic example. You just put in the, the three library, current version, version four. You have a content, an element that you bind it to, and then you, you select it with the three is kind of a bit like a jQuery syntax style. Um, you append a new SVG element for you, and then you can start putting, connecting it to your data. So here you have five data points, and for each of those, we want to have the rectangular printed on the screen, and we can give it the features. So I just let me think this in for a second. So here you have the great advantage of D3. You don't have to do a loop over your data. You connect the data, and then you always get this function data in, and can either do something on the index, so um, where it is, or based on the data. So here you would just do the data. Great. Has an, somebody an idea what will be the result in the browser if we execute that? What kind of chart would it, might it be? Yes, correct. So the visible result of this will be like this. So it's already a good start. And if you look into the inspection, you see that uh, D3 really created those nodes. And if you work with SVG, this is really nice because you see the values and you can see what went wrong. Um, you can also work with Canvas, but then you don't see that at all. And it's not so recommendable because then it's pixel-based and normally charts are vectors. So it's better to use a format that suits that. Right. So if you're going to go further from that, so now we only had these bars. And we were a bit lucky that we choose the size appropriately, but normally you have no idea what the data will look at the end. So if you're unlucky, it will be either the difference won't be visible or it will be so high that it touches the, the maximum width of your space. So D3 is really helpful here and provides you a scale. So you put in, OK, my space is from 0 to 500, so 500 pixel space I have. And now consider the maximum value I have and scale it appropriately. So what this will result is here. So the maximum um, is always here and the others are in relation to that, and now you can easily see this. So this is really helpful because doing that on your own is a bit hard um, to do every time. So you can also paint axis. So here um, it's a bit more code, maybe it's a bit um, more difficult. So you first append a group, and you transform it to be at the bottom, and then you tell D3 to paint this based on the scale on the slide before. So it will be looked like this, and it's much easier than before, because you have here those um, ticks and numbers printed for you according to your data. So that's already a big advantage of D3, providing you all those things. And that's very nice. You can have interactions. So if you maybe want to have a sort and click, um, you can easily do that. And you tell it, so here the bar is newly introduced uh, before, so every one of those. And if you click on one of those, all those bars will be selected and sorted. So this already helps you to add interaction if you want to do that. Great. So there are some pitfalls you might run into when you do D3. So here's a little example. There's some like four, four things hidden. So maybe you're writing this code, and you're going to the browser, and you're wondering why things don't work as expected. So there's a little like quiz for you. If you spot any of the errors, there are at least four in it. I hope not too much more. Anybody in Diego? So some, of the, some stuff you can get even if you don't know D3 because it's just like wrong. And sorry? Yes, very good. It's nested. So here you have an append, and the other append will go into the text node. 
And then if you append the rectangular here, the rectangular will be in the text node, though this will not work very well, right? Something else? Are there some people like really doing D3 on a daily basis or like many times? Yeah. You have an idea? Okay, I'll help. So this one is already done, that's the nesting. So things you shouldn't do. So what you hear is a missing return. So especially if you're uh, writing uh, in function syntax, you will always have that in egg. Here it's right, like it's there, it's correctly. Um, the whole calculation is correct, but then you're like, why is there a zero? And it's just because of that, because you missed the return. Um, here was already correct the uh, wrong nesting. Here you have a magic number, never ever do this, never even commit this anywhere because you will never ever figure out what, why this is 152. And here don't do duplicate functions because you also don't know what is this, like why is it multiplied by 37. So if you want to do it better, you introduce some uh, constants. So you know now this 152 was the margin and the width of the text. If you do it like this and somebody else is going here, he will easily get it and you don't have this magic numbers here. So you, this is kind of a configuration thing that if you want to change it, then it's easily um, to change it and all numbers will update. And not just one number and then you're like, here the other number and here the other number. Right. So you can't not only have mistakes in, um, in your code, you can also like intentionally or unintentionally lie with your data. So if you look here, you think like, if this is like stock market, you would say like, yeah, let's invest. But you cheated a lot because here it's 100 to 1000 and here it's two. So if you wanted would it paint it normally, this would just like, be totally like not visible and not significant at all. But that might be more obvious if you see those in newspapers, you can easily like point at that and say like, that's a lie factor. But it's even getting better if you do it like with um, circles because here it's 10%, the radius is one, 20% the radius is two. I mean, that's completely correct like measuring, but still you're lying because um, you will feel this in a square so this is even four times as big in your visual um, when you perceive it. So you can also lie with this. Depending on what you want to do, you can either like choose it because you want to display it, but normally it's an accident and you shouldn't do that. Right, so my real advice, if you're doing dashboard visualizations, um, test with different data sets. So maybe you're doing a little chart and you paint it before, you say, okay, that's what I want to do. Three variants can't be that hard and then you have the real text coming in and it looks like that. Because someone named your variant blue button test, red button test, and yellow button test, and then it's all messed up. So try to either get real data sets in before or create some, and really be like, um, this is very like, if someone is putting in really small data or very huge data. So always imagine if still the graph is telling something or if the one large number is destroying everything else. Right, also if you use any metaphors, this can be really hard because this could look like, okay, I mean, that's clearly, and, and then you ask people and they will tell a lot of different things like um, what this could be. This could be a, a table, a logo, a circle, sunshine, so be aware that you give some explanations at your side. So this is really my advice for you. Like, go out, even if you have only scribbled something on paper and give it to someone's like, what can you tell me if you see this? And if you can't get like, okay, variant A is better, then go back, try something new, try something better. So if we look back at the beginning from our A-B test, it could also be very simple and just summing up the values so it's nearly the same chart, just summing up the things over time, and then we clearly know, okay, we make more money with variant B, so go with variant B, and hopefully get your eyes. Great, so here's some links, the slides are online, so just check that out. If you have any questions or want to talk about D3 or visualization in general, 
Um, I'm very happy to talk about those, and the slides are there. Thank you.